You are listening to the David Cassidy Connections with your host, Louise Poynton. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the David Cassidy Connections, your podcast all about David, his music, his friendships, his legacy. I am your host, Louise Poynton, and today I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, Las Vegas entertainer, Michael LaRocca. Michael started his show business career in 1970 in a local production in Buffalo, New York of The Wizard of Oz, a film which has been an important part of his life. Three years later, and still only 14, he made his professional debut and went on to star in a successful nightclub show, Bravo Broadway. He has hosted several telecasts of the Miss America State Pageant, his own television shows, starred in numerous stage musicals, including Grease, Godspell, Oklahoma and Cabaret. He has also created several musical reviews and taken his successful one-man show to Las Vegas. Michael is a minister with the Universal Life Church and calls himself the Tin Man as a result of numerous spinal surgeries he has undergone. He has been a David Cassidy fan since 1970, admitting the majority of things he has done in his life lead back to David. The link to his Facebook page, The Partridge Family Get on the Bus, can be found in the accompanying show notes. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much, Louise. I never told you that Louise is one of my very favorite names. Oh, really? Yes. I have an Aunt Louise, who I adored. She was my grandmother's aunt, so aunt twice removed. And I'm a big fan of the musical Gypsy. So every time I hear your name, I think, Louise, sing out Louise. (laughs) (laughs) Now, your career, Michael, has been spectacular and taken you on a long journey with many challenges, which we will discuss. But all roads, as I said just now, lead back to David Cassidy. Can you tell me why he's been so important to you? Prior to the Partridge family coming on the air, I was a Bobby Sherman fan. And I had Bobby Sherman posters all over my walls in my bedroom. When the Partridge family came on the air that night, I I was transformed. I took down all the Bobby posters. And David was starting to appear in the magazines, but not as much yet. I, I took the posters down, I couldn't wait, and I wanted to hear them sing again. After the telecast, that first night, my dad took me to get pizza. The song Indiana Wants Me came on the air, and it was as close to the Partridge family melodically. And I just kept hearing that song over and over, and I wanted the records, and I wanted to see David again. And I couldn't wait till the next week. But this was all before uh, um internet and cell phones and so you just had to wait and you had to look at the magazines so that's what I did and then being a nightclub entertainer which I've done musicals which I love Um, I've worked with Miss America pageant which I loved but being a Vegas entertainer was my primary goal and the two people that influenced me the most were David Cassidy and Lola Falana those are the two entertainers that I said I have to do this that's what I want to do I want to be like the Partridge family going to Las Vegas and they did so yes (laughs) he's been so much a part of me um, my entire life And uh, in Las Vegas, I put a Partridge Family segment in my show. I had all the the rust-colored, the original costumes made for my cast. I played David, and it was such a big hit. Even that, putting him in my show and him being part of that. Yeah, so he's been an 
tremendous influence. I have, there's one picture I have of David in the recording session uh, like this, and I have a picture exactly the same way from the recording session. So, yeah, very big influence. Can you just elaborate on that influence? Being younger in 1970, um, watching the show every week and having the albums and the music and playing it over and over. I still play it in my car. Uh, playing his music over and over again. I saw him in concert, and I couldn't move for hours after the concert. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I was totally mesmerized by him. And I saw Bobby Sherman in concert, too, but it wasn't the same. And... You know, here I, I was with a cousin of mine, and here I am in this big auditorium, all these screaming women, and I'm just sitting there with my mouth open going, I, I want to be him. I want this. I want to do this. Um, even one of my costumes that I had in Las Vegas was very similar to the one he wore in that concert. It was a white jumpsuit with a lot of fringe. And um, so I have a white jacket with a lot of fringe that uh, that I wore in my biggest show. There is the story of him and I almost meeting. Do you want to hear that one? I'd love to. Okay. Yes. Tell us that. In Las Vegas with the Partridge Family segment in my show, one of the entertainment papers, this is when David was doing uh, FX at the MGM Grand. And the paper kept saying, David, when are you going to see Michael? David, when are you going to see Michael? He's doing this tribute to you. It was my night off, and I went to the movies with a friend. My pager and I had left that in the car. And the hotel, I was playing at the Debbie Reynolds Hotel at the time. And the hotel kept paging me over and over. When I, the movie was over and I got in the car and seeing all these pages from the hotel, so I thought well, something was wrong, maybe a fire or something. So I called back the hotel and they said, where have you been? I said, why? What's the matter? David Cassidy came here to meet you. Yeah. He waited around, I guess, for about 40 minutes and, and they said he, they couldn't get in touch with me. So I'm performing he's performing and we never actually met mm. and mm. that for me was a very sad day and when he died I, that's never going to happen i'm never going to actually meet him and and see him and even as he got older and his voice was changing I, I was still by his side. I think in some ways he became a dear friend, even though we never met yeah. in person close, but never met. But my sad David Cassidy story, we just didn't ever connect again. And he came there to see me. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. Did you have the chance to go and see any of his shows when he was in Vegas? No. No. Oh. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, the schedules were pretty similar yeah. in performance. Yeah. Mm. Do you think Vegas was a good place for him to be? Would you have perhaps preferred to see him doing a different kind of acting well, and no, entertaining? In, in FX, he was, um, again, because of our similar schedules, I never really got to see that show. Um, I had a friend who worked on it. I read the reviews. Um, I actually auditioned for it when Michael... Uh, Crawford. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, doing it. I was auditioning it for his understudy, and it was before I got the job at Debbie Reynolds Hotel. So I knew about the show, etc. But I, I think he 
shined in that particular production because I guess they did include some Partridge Family stuff where he went into the audience. There are certain people in Las Vegas that can be headliners and do the Frank Sinatra. Bette Midler was like that. Big production shows centered around her. I think people went to CFX because of David because he was in it. He did Blood Brothers on Broadway with his brother, but I think concert life was better for him. Yeah, his concert life, where he was there singing his songs to his crowd, that was always packed, always packed for him. I miss him terribly, terribly miss Mm -hmm. him. Uh, I would have liked to have had the opportunity just to sit and talk with him, to let him know what a big influence he was. I did get to do that with Lola Falana, so at least half of my two influences I did (laughs) have time with. (laughs) Tell me about the other influence, where that originated from. Well, it originated uh, from with Lola Falana, was the first Vegas entertainer I ever saw. I can't remember what year it was, 1980, maybe. She was headlining uh, with Frankie Valli, and we went to see the shows my first time in Vegas as a tourist. Went to see her show, and again, I was speechless. I couldn't talk afterward. And as we were driving back up the strip, I was counting letters of stars' names to see if my name was going to fit (laughs) on one of those marquees. Then uh, Lola had um, her muscular dystrophy challenge, and she stopped. And she said that if she prayed to God that if I am healed, I'll spend the rest of my life ministering for you. She got her healing. She received her healing. She gave up show business. And I was singing at that time at the cathedral in Las Vegas. And this one little Italian nun kept saying, oh, you're just like Lola Falana. She would come in, blah, blah, blah. She came to church. She was visiting her mother. She came to church. And I finally had the opportunity to meet her and sit and talk with her about her influence in my life, and not only as an entertainer, but also spiritually. Because once I lost my voice and couldn't sing anymore, she was there. She was part of what I was doing. And then I was able, they hired me to be the so-called Master of Ceremonies for the Bishop of Las Vegas, and I was putting together all of his masses, traveling, and putting his big Eastern Christmas masses on television. So I was still doing what I loved to do. It was very similar to pageants. In fact, the bishop said once, he thinks I miss America. (laughs) Yes. Um, (laughs) But all through that part of my life, Lola was there, right. part of uh, the church, part of me as well. As I said, I met one half of my influence, and the other passed away way too soon for me. Yeah. My throat surgery, well, it was actually surgery on my lungs, not my throat. Um, after Debbie's place closed, um, we were looking for, uh, an, oh, no, I'm sorry. It was after the World Trade Center, which was my second hotel. After they closed, uh, it was right before 9-11. My God, I had that. That happened to me, 9-11 here in, in New York. And then my friend murdered in December. But I was um, in the hospital. I thought I had the AIDS pneumonia, the pneumocystis pneumonia, because I couldn't breathe and... I called this uh, priest that was part of the AIDS organization I had been volunteering with, and he put me in touch with this doctor, and the doctor put me in the hospital right away, and he said, you have pneumonia in both lungs, and it's really bad. 
So what I need to do is prepare you for the worst and let's hope for the best. My parents came up from Arizona. My friends all the way, you know, were coming to say goodbye to me. They didn't know if I was going to live or die. And they did this surgical procedure where I had to be under anesthesia, and they went through my throat to flush out my lungs. That was the only way they could get it all out. And one of the things I had to sign was that vocal cords could be affected by this kind of thing that they're going to do. And they were. Now, I, uh, the last ear, nose, and throat specialist I saw uh, said, you don't have any more scar tissue, but you're going to need to learn how to speak and how to breathe much differently with a speech therapist and a vocal coach. Um, I haven't done that. So I've allowed this voice to remain the only thing that I find difficult at times is when I call the phone company or the cable company and, and they'll say, well, ma'am, could you hold on a bit? I guess my voice sounds like an old woman who has smoked for 50 years. So I have to correct them. That's fine. Let's go back to your early years. Were the movies always an important part of your life when you were growing up? Yes, yes. We had a theater here called Studio Arena Theater, and I started taking acting classes at that theater when I was 12. And siren going by, and the dogs barking. <laughs> I started professionally, as you said, when I was 14 years old. Um, I started my professional career. So at that theater, I got to apprentice on many shows. I was in other shows. And I actually, it was funny because 20 years later, I went back and taught at the school, at the acting school. Um, so I had all these uh, professionals around me all the time. And right. the musicals. Um, I remember we did, I did Peter Pan with Bonnie Franklin, and it was just mesmerizing. Um, her first night flying uh, during our tech rehearsal, and she, Peter Foy, the big flying guy, he does all this flying things uh, there in Las Vegas, he flew her. And she went up, and she's flying back and forth across the stage, and she started crying. And they brought her down. She took Peter Foy. She hugged him and said, you have just made the dream of my life come true. It was so touching, you know? Being around Celeste Holm, who was the fairy godmother in Cinderella, I was with all these people that I respected as artists, and was able to learn from. One of the things that this was the part of that apprentice program I was part of during high school was you had to learn every aspect of the theater. You had to work on lights. You had to work on props. You had to work backstage as a dresser. There were so many different things you had to do. I remember sewing appellets on a production of Romeo and Juliet doing costumes. And the reason was that you could appreciate, as an actor, all the people around you that are making you look good, that are making you the star you want to be. So that um, influence in my life was, was very, very helpful all through high school. And then I just continued on with musical theater, always wanting more. I want to be in Vegas. I want to be a nightclub act. And um, there must be something going on. <laughs> so um, <laughs> putting together Bravo Broadway was a tremendous hit from day one. I was actually kind of shocked at how big it became so quickly. We had two companies at one time, one out west and one back east, um, performing all over the place. It was a, a show, a review of Broadway show songs. And so I was finally 
doing the nightclub part of it. There was a dinner theater here where um, we were performing, and but it was late night. We have a huge, huge theater here called the Shays Buffalo Theater. And that's where they bring in all the big national tours, Hamilton, Wicked, all the big national tours come to that theater. The nightclub was right behind the stage door. It was right across the street from the stage door. So, so many times the actors would come over. The little girls from Annie loved me. <laughs> when <laughs> Annie was there. Um, but, so we were doing um, the nightclub part of it. And then I said, you know, maybe we could do some musicals here as well. We could do the musicals early in the evening and then do the nightclub show at night. So there were times when I was on stage from 8 o'clock at night until 2 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Um, and, but it was wonderful. It was a great time. And then Miss yeah. America came along, and that's history again. Another yes. magical yeah. moment of my life. Yeah. Yes. They tell us today that we don't have stars because they're not processed in the same way as they were during the golden age of Hollywood. When people were growing up in the 1920s, 1930s, you wanted to be a movie star. That was everyone's dream. Who do you consider the greatest actors from the golden age of Hollywood? Being at the Debbie Reynolds Hotel in Las Vegas... My show was the second show of the evening. Debbie Reynolds' show was on first, and then I was on the second show, and then Kenny Kerr, who was a very famous female impersonator, had his own show, which was the late night show. There were times when I would stand backstage and just watch her. And be mesmer. I mean, she was in her 60s. She wasn't tap dancing like she did in Singing in the Rain. <laughs> but she was still out there. Now, she was trained in that way. What to do, what to say, how to address uh, the press, how to run your life. And even through her... Uh, being America's sweetheart at one time, and then her divorce from Eddie Fisher and the whole thing with Elizabeth Taylor. She stuck it out. And working, not in her show, but being part of the Debbie Reynolds family there at the hotel, I got to see her when she was Debbie, the person, and Debbie Reynolds, the star. She knew exactly when to do what she needed to do to make it right. And this her 65th birthday, they were producing this big party for her with a lot of other Vegas stars, having this big party for her. Kenny and I were going to emcee the show for her and do segments of our show in this other thing. This producer came in from California, and he had all these other acts performing for her. And she was wonderful. She sat in the front, greeted everybody. They brought the big prop birthday cake out onto the stage. Wow. And I uh, introduced her, you know, ending with and the unsinkable Miss Debbie Reynolds. She comes up on stage. The audience, of course, is standing. She's waving to everybody. She gives me a big hug and kisses me and said, I hate this. I won't say the word. But then in my ear, she became just Debbie. Debbie Reynolds, obviously, and Judy Garland. Is there something very special about any actor, be they in the movies or on stage, where they can effectively give the audience a backstage pass to who they are? emotionally. They expose themselves in such a way through the characters they're playing that they reveal a little bit of themselves. Well, I think as an actor, you, and there are many actors that do this. I, I've heard that Meryl Streep, even when they break, they're in character. She stays in character. 
I did Vegas Vacation. I was a featured extra in Vegas Vacation, and it paid my bill for one summer, which was great. But you sit around and wait more than you actually do stuff. So I know a lot of the actors, and I've read about them, uh, Heath Ledger, similar, where they get so engrossed in the character. For myself personally, it hurt quite a bit because people would see me on stage. Now I was in my 20s and early 30s in my heyday. You know, I had a 32-inch waist at the time going to the gym every day and no gray hair. Um, <laughs> And people would see me on stage and they would, oh, I'm such a big crush on you. I remember being with this one gentleman and he said, I can't believe I'm sitting here with Michael LaRocca. Oh, my God. So they were in love or fell in love with the onstage persona. When they got to know the real person behind the onstage persona, they said, oh, my God, he spars when he sleeps, and he has to go to the bathroom, and he looks terrible when he wakes up in the morning. And, yeah, because that's the real me. That's not. Yeah. So, for me, letting people in was always discouraging because oh, I, I felt if I let them in, eventually they're, they're going to want to go their own way because I'm not what they think I am. And I think a lot of actors will go through that. Um, maybe that's why actors will marry and fall in love with other actors or people in the industry so they can understand better. And they know that there's the real person behind the stage persona, like Debbie Reynolds. And, you know, we, we've seen documentaries about Judy Garland, um, but... So to answer the question, I think that it's very difficult for actors to be themselves and let somebody in because you don't know why they're in. Mm. You don't know if they're in because they fell in love with something on stage or they, uh, <laughs> it's the big dog, or they um, are getting to know the real you. And the funny thing is, as my feelings for that person would grow, theirs were started, their feelings were starting to diminish because I was getting to know the person yeah. and they were finding out I wasn't the persona. And I think that a lot of actors and singers go through that. I just wonder if you had met David, maybe your image of him may have turned out to be different because so many actors say, like you said just now, if people really knew the real me, maybe they wouldn't like me. So it's best that I keep them at arm's length and I just mm -hmm. continue to sell the image. With David, I think it was different because when I was ready to meet him, I was ready to meet the real him and not the onstage persona. We were... Uh, both entertainers at that time. We were both in Las Vegas, you know. Um, you hear about what the person went through. And I think growing up in the theater, being in the theater from the time I was very young, I always was behind the scenes and seeing celebrities like Celeste Holm and Bonnie Franklin and uh, um, oh God, John Voigt. Uh, and other people like that, you see them because you're working with them. So you've already seen yeah. their, you know, Bonnie would love to walk around the dressing room with no top on. She was always hot. <laughs> she, you know, I got an early uh, sex education from that because I was, I was 14. No, I was 15 at the time when we did. Mm.